second guess in some ways, somebody is, I'm sure of that. Hey, it's time to start church, so come on in and have a seat. And uh, we can do some visit afterwards. So uh, today, to start our worship service, hopefully you got a bulletin when you came in today. And uh, one of the verses that I'm going to read to you today uh, from the Word is actually on the front of the bulletin. It's a powerful verse of Scripture uh, from, from first, of course, from first Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So uh, this morning, take out the bulletin. And let's read that verse together as our call to worship this morning. And then after we do, um, we'll have a word of prayer. So stay with me as we read that verse of Scripture. All right, you ready? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God possession that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so grateful that we can gather together as your church this morning and as we just declare your praises, as we lift up and magnify your name, Lord, may you be praised in your church and may you be glorified. May we set everything aside it's on our minds and our hearts and may we just focus on you completely this morning and just Lord may you be glorified today in this place in Jesus name Amen Jesus is 
Uh, announcements down through there. And if you'll check your books up for the, our prayers and praises as well. We've got a lot going on here at Peace Crest Christian Church. I don't know how God packs so much in this little building, but he does. And we are so thankful for it. So now we're going to come to a time of communion where we're going to have a communion song and a communion song. Into the world to defend the world. 
but the Savior. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of God's Son. <clears throat> Jesus came here as a man to be an example to show us how we should live our lives. So our rewards were much greater than what he received from him. Through all of his suffering and pain that he went through for the sins of the world and for the new covenant, he died a criminal's death on that cross. And by doing this, he asked us to remember him and believe in him with the bread and the cup whenever we meet together in his name. What an awesome God we have. Gentlemen, let us pray. Thank you, Father, for his son, Jesus, who suffered on the pilot, who was crucified, died, and was buried, who rise again on the third day, who ascended to sit at the right hand of our God, the Father, the Creator of all things. Now we thank you and love you through your Son and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray.
Joe and Sandy, and uh, we're fully uh, open up our Bibles today. Let's uh, go to God in prayer. Oh, Lord, we just uh, thank you, Lord, for this day, and just thank you for the times when we can uh, sing our songs of praise and worship to you, and meet you, Lord, around your table this morning, uh, for taking these emblems, Lord, that represent your body and blood, and just to give to you, Lord, and to worship you, and just to celebrate who you are, Lord. We're grateful, we're thankful, we praise you, Lord, for the relationship that we have with you through your Son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that you made for each of us, Lord. We long, Lord, to, uh, in everything we do, and everything we say, Lord, to bring glory and honor to you. Uh, this morning, Lord, as we as a church body here today, just collectively, Lord, we think of those that have needs in their life. There's some that are struggling with a sickness and disease and suffering, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that you would wrap your healing arms around them, restore their strength, restore their health and their wellness. We pray that you would bless them at that time, even today, Lord. There's some, Lord, that we know that have lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort them. We know of others that are dealing with difficult challenges in life. Lord, we just pray that they would look to you for the guidance and wisdom and direction for answers for them. Lord, we pray for our nation, for our country. We pray for our leaders make wise and godly decisions. We pray for the servicemen and service women serving around the world. We keep them safe, bring them home soon. We pray as a, a local church here in this community that we might make a difference for you and just faithfully proclaim your gospel to a, to a world that desperately needs it all. But now we come to a time of worship where we Open up our Bibles, Lord, to study your word. I pray that your spirit might illuminate the scriptures to us. Help us to better understand them and to practice them in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you brought your Bible and you can open it up with me and turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'd like to read uh, verses 9 through 12. And as we uh, continue to make our way through this letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to the Christians who are going through the, the second wave of persecution of the church that was coming from uh, the government, from the Roman leaders and Roman authorities, and the pressure that they were experiencing, he's writing this letter to encourage them about the truth about who they are in Christ and the significance of the grace that they had from Christ, that God would give them, uh, the glory that was coming to them, and the life that He had given them, and how they could persevere and make it through all that they're going through in their life. And so then the application for us as we read this scripture 2,000 years later is what, what, how can it help us through the stuff of life that we go through? When we get to this passage this morning, this uh, famous verse that we quoted earlier, it's on the front of your bulletin, you know, 1 Peter 2.9. As he leads us into that verse, and then the verses that follow, what I believe he wanted to teach the church then and for us now is about the misunderstandings that happen in life. Sometimes misunderstandings can be so painful that they're worse than even physical pain. When we are misunderstood by what we mean or what we say, it can bring agonizing heartache to our life. Let me give you some examples of, of what's happening to the church then. What kind of misunderstanding that they're going through as a church and, and the Christians were facing. This church and the, the early churches were facing misunderstandings by the Gentile, which were the unbelieving, unredeemed people of their day and time. 
And if you checked back into the uh, church history during this time, you would see these misunderstandings. The Gentiles thought that the, certain things about the Christians. One of them was that they thought the Christians were cannibals. The Christians, and then it grows, right? The Christians would talk about partaking of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so they thought that when the Christians got together, that they would sacrifice someone and actually eat someone at their worship service. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? How could they possibly misunderstand something like that? You think about the day and the time when they had no, the, the Gentiles had no point of reference of what the Lord's Supper was and what the Christians were doing. The Christians at that time were known by the Gentiles to be anti-marriage and anti-family. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when Paul is talking to the Christians there, we learn this about the misunderstanding of the unredeemed then about the church. Because here's what would happen. A wife would come to know the Lord and be saved. And the transformation start happening in her life. Her husband, who's not saved, would want to, want to go down just like they've always done all of their life to the local temple and participate in the sexual immorality in the Roman temple. And, and that was how they would worship their pagan God. And because she wouldn't do this, because now she was a Christian, he'd get mad and upset. He would, be, he would feel embarrassed among his friends because his wife wasn't, and eventually he would divorce her, and worse than that, just throw her out on the streets. They thought that Christians were anti-family, anti-marriage. They thought that Christians were atheists. You know what atheist means, don't believe in God. They thought the Christians didn't believe in God because the Christians stopped worshiping the emperor and their gods that they've always worshipped. And so they drew the conclusion that these Christians must not even believe in God because they don't worship God. Because their only concept of a God was the emperor and the temple down the street. So Christians were accused of being atheists. Not to mention the fact that they were misunderstood for being blamed for burning the city of Rome. Nero was trying to promote this among the media. That they were the ones that caused that. When they had nothing to do with it. They were misunderstood. They were misunderstood when they called each other brothers and sisters in Christ. They thought the church was made up of incestuous relationships. Because these Christians were calling each other brothers and sisters in Christ. So there were lots of misunderstandings going on during this time in which these Christians are facing. But then I began to think about what about today in our culture, in our society, and the misunderstanding that goes on when we present the things that we believe in or the things that are in, clearly in the Word of God. I thought about some moral issues like abortion where we believe the taking of life is wrong and it's sinful in God's sight. But our culture and our society says it's really the woman's choice and she can choose even up to the point after the baby, the child is born, to abort that child. And yet our views, the church is completely misunderstood. I thought about the moral issue of our day of sexuality and homosexuality and, and how that if you say anything negative against that in, in your speech, you're considered to be prejudicial or racious, racial or weird or strange or not tolerant. Even though we as Christians love all people, no matter what kinds of sins are involved in your life, we love all people, it's still misunderstood. 
I thought about the religious misunderstanding that goes on in our culture, in our society, in which uh, we live. Our world doesn't believe in absolute truth anymore. Truth is relative to the situation and the circumstance. And when you as a Christian say, there is an absolute truth, and there is an absolute way of living, we are misunderstood. I thought about the greatest false doctrine of religion that most people buy into that salvation is based upon good works. And if you're good enough, you'll go to heaven. And so you strive all your life to, be, to do good works. You never know whether or not you're going to be saved until you die. And then hopefully you'll get in. Instead of what the Bible teaches us. Teaches us about saved by grace through faith and the assurance of salvation. I thought about how the, the world in which we live misunderstands um, sin, what real godlike love is in our world. So I thought about the misunderstandings that they experience. I thought about the misunderstandings that we experience. And then we come to our text. And I believe that Peter gave the church then and even us now. How do, you, how do you function in a world where you're constantly going to be, if you stand for Christ and believe in the Word of God and the truth, how, how do you stand in that society? How do you live in that kind of culture, even when you're misunderstood? So let me read the verses to you. If you don't mind, when you stand as I read the Bible to you? And then before you sit down, I'll encourage you with at least one take home today to consider or to think about. So 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9, he says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as aliens and strangers, to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the things in which they slander you as evil doers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So before you sit down, share with your neighbor this one day one. And it's simply this. Let's, have a, let's learn how to do what's opposite. Let's learn how to do what's opposite. You can be seen. Thank you. How do you learn to do what is opposite? What is the first thing that goes through your mind when you are misunderstood? Many times when you're misunderstood, you immediately, you, sometimes you'll get frustrated. Sometimes when you're misunderstood, you'll get angry or mad or upset. You'll respond how you naturally respond to things. I think that that's what Peter was thinking about when he's thinking about these Christians and the constant misunderstanding that they're, they're dealing with in their life is he wants to challenge them to, to, to do what's opposite of what you naturally would do. Because in these verses, I believe he gives us three ways to respond to misunderstanding or three ways to deal with it. Now, I think, I believe he's talking about misunderstandings because in our verses he talks about darkness and light. And if you choose to walk in the light, you are going to be misunderstood by darkness. He told you and I that we are aliens and strangers in this world. You are sometimes going to be an alien, like you don't belong in this world. You're from some other world because of the way you're living. Or you're, sometimes you will be called strange and odd because of the way you're living. 
he says that in our text, that as the Gentiles are going to slander you, they're going to say all kinds of things against you because they misunderstand who you are and even what you're teaching. And when, they, when, you, when you go through the slandering process, you're going to be misunderstood. So that's why I came to the conclusion that what he's really teaching us is how to respond and how to respond to misunderstanding. So first, he says this in our text. He says that we should proclaim God's excellencies. You should proclaim God's word. Proclaim God's truth. It sounds odd. It sounds like if I'm misunderstood, what I should do is try to explain it away. What I should do when somebody says something to me or, mis or, or, or there's a failure to communicate with this person and there's a misunderstanding, I should compromise what I just said. Or I should say it another way so it won't become across as so offensive instead of just simply proclaiming the truth. Now, I think he wants to tell us the way in which we're going to proclaim the truth, even when we're misunderstood, is to remember who you are in Christ and then to focus on the purpose that God has in your life. So he says, remember who you are. You are a chosen race. The word chosen means that God voted for you. That God set His affection upon you. It says in Deuteronomy 10, verse 15, about the chosen people of God. You are a chosen race. You are secondly a royal priesthood. God sees uh, believers as priests in His kingdom, serving Him, making sacrifices for Him. The sacrifices that the Bible says of praise, the sacrifice of good works, the sacrifices of controlling our anger, the sacrifices of sharing with others, the sacrifices of giving. As we sacrifice, we are acting like priests. But because we're a priest, he says you are a royal priest. We have a connection with the king. We serve with the king. He says this is who you are in Christ. You are a holy nation. The word holy always means separate and set apart for a special purpose and use. As a Christian, you've been set apart for God's special use and purpose in this world and in your life. He says you are a people for God's own possession. God owns you because you know Him. He purchased you with the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You are owned by Christ. You are owned by God. He says you are called. He has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And God has a marvelous plan for your life. And God took you from the dark to light. He says, lastly, that you have received mercy in verse 10. And when He uses the word mercy, He's not talking about general mercy of God's kindness and goodness in your life. He's talking about divine mercy. The kind of divine mercy that rescues believers from judgment and hell and grants them an eternal inheritance with Him. He says, this is who you are in Christ. But secondly, this is your purpose. Your purpose is so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him. Or you may proclaim His praises. That word, excellencies, that Peter uses in our text, means, means that He has done something that was powerful and effective and heroic. You and I get the privilege of proclaiming the supernatural power of God to redeem a lost person and bless them with eternal life. You and I get that privilege. That word proclaim means that you're going to advertise, you're going to publish to the world around you the great mercies of God and His, uh, His, His redeeming message to mankind. It's a privilege that we get. So in the times of misunderstandings, we continue to proclaim His praises, His excellencies, 
by not forgetting who we are in Christ and for lovingly proclaiming Christ to the world. We don't compromise. We don't let down our guard. We don't tolerate. We continue to proclaim the love of Christ. So he says, even in the midst of your misunderstanding, be faithful to the proclamation of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in your life. The second thing he challenges us with, I believe, in the midst of our misunderstanding would be this, and it is to abstain from fleshly impulses. He says this in verse, verse 11, abstain from these things. To abstain, he is putting it in a command mode. A command that you must obey. But whenever God gives us a command in His Word of something to do, He always gives us the power in order to do the command. So He says, I'm commanding you to do something. It's not, you can do it in the power and strength that God gives you. You won't be able to do it in your natural power and in your natural strength, but you will in your supernatural God strength. You can abstain. Abstain. What does that word abstain mean? What does it challenge us to do? It says abstain from this because it wages a war in your soul. There's a war going on. And the war is between the redeemed soul within us and the unredeemed flesh on the outside. It's as if there is a civil war going on within us. A battle, a war raging. He says he uses the word war to talk about the intensity of it. He doesn't say it's a battle. It's not something that comes and goes in your life. It's a constant war that's going on. And he says the challenge is all of your life is to learn to abstain. So how do we learn to abstain? I read an illustration this week that drove this home point, this point home to me. And it was this illustration about uh, someone in Alaska, an Eskimo, who had two husky dogs. And he would take these dogs from village to village and he would race these two dogs. They both look just alike. They, look, they both look strong. They both look healthy. Because of the weather and the temperature from village to village, he would go and race these two dogs. And his whole goal was to get people to bet on which dog was going to win. And every time he would race, every day of the week, one dog would win, the other dog would win. He would always guess which dog was going to win. So finally somebody asked me, how do you know which dog is going to win the race today? And the man simply said this to him. It's the dog that I choose to feed that day. <laughs> and that's hard to see. The dog I choose to feed that day. The same is true in our lives. Which nature are we going to feed today? Are we going to feed the redeemed soul God has redeemed within us? Are we, going to, are we going to feed the Spirit of God within us? Or are we going to feed the flesh? How does the Bible tell us or teach us how to do this? What's the key? How do we feed the right nature of well, Paul would say it this way in Ephesians chapter 6. You've got to put on the armor of God. You've got to realize you're in this war. And in the war, you've got to put the armor on. You've got to have the helmet of salvation. You've got to have the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to have the belt of truth around your waist. You've got to have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You gotta take the shield of faith in your in your left hand, and you gotta take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and you've got to do battle today. You've got to gear up for the battle. You've got to face the battle for today. You've got to face it head on. Paul didn't give us anything to protect us 
if we turned and ran. Our back was going to be open. We were going to get stabbed in the back by all kinds of stuff that Satan was going to throw at us. So what he says is square up with it and put on the armor of God. That's how we're going to overcome. The Bible also tells us the way that we're going to overcome. Another picture. I think about from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul wanted to picture it again for the believers. And he says it's like this. It's like running a race. You run the race to get the prize. You want to get the wreath when you run the race. When you box, you don't want to just box at the air all the time. Eventually, you want to face somebody and you want to... Right? You want to conquer. He says that infamous, infamous verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he says, I buffet my body and I make it my slave so that when I get to the end of my life, I want to be counted worthy in God's sight. And that word buffet means I bruise my body. I intensely work at controlling my body at beating the inside and not the outside. The Bible also tells us that we need to learn how to walk in the Spirit. Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, when Paul was writing to that church, he said, this is how you're going to overcome the flesh. You're going to walk in the Spirit. What in the world does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Is that some kind of mystical, some kind of emotional high that you get on once you've sang some songs or, or got all worked up? Is that what it means to walk in the Spirit? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Paul says we are to be filled with the Spirit. He used the same verb. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And he used the same verb. So what, it, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It means not to be intoxicated with the world, but to dwell on the word of God richly in your life. To work, to, to study the Word, to allow the Word of God to dwell in you so much that when you're tempted with that stuff of life and when the pressure comes on you in your life, you, you're going to respond because the Holy Spirit's got something to work on. He's got the Word of God to direct you and guide you in your life. So you're going to walk by the Spirit, by dwelling on the Word of God richly in your life. So when the misunderstandings come, don't cave in, but instead, abstain. Don't do what's natural, do what's opposite. They tell us that when we're under extreme stress in our life, that we, we, will, we will be forced to do and respond in our natural way in which we've always responded. When the stress of life comes on, instead of responding how we naturally would, responding how we would, how we might used to would before we came to Christ, we have to learn to do the opposite. To not let the flesh win, but let the spirit win. Do the opposite. In our nature, our natural, outward fleshly nature, wanting us to to do. Lastly, I believe Peter challenges us to keep your behavior excellent. You're going to keep your behavior excellent. We looked at verse 12 in your text. It says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Gentiles means non-Christian. People that are unredeemed. It says, so that the things in which they slander you as evildoers they may, because of your good deeds, as they observed them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So even in the midst of your misunderstanding, keep your behavior excellent. Keep your behavior lovely, fine, winsome, gracious, fair, noble to those around you. 
In order to effectively proclaim Christ, Christians' transformed inner lives must be visible to the outside world. They must see us living out the truth of God's word and the truth of God's scriptures. He says in that verse, may they observe your good deeds and glorify God. May they observe how you're living your life and glorify God. You underline that in your Bible. That is how Peter would define how, how we are to evangelize the world. We are to do our good deeds in front of the world so that they will, they will glorify God. That's what the Word of God says. So we live the Christian life in the midst of the world. We live a righteous life. We will proclaim it in our words, but our life and our testimony. Wouldn't you much rather see someone living their faith than hear them go on and on and on about it? It's a testimony to the world. It's the best evangelism tool. And a lot of times, a lot of churches will think it's not the best evangelism tool. That we need to help God out. That we need to do this and do that in order to get people to, to hear us. We need to lower our standards. We need to compromise some of the truth. We don't need to stand so firmly on that doctrine or that truth so that it will be more appealing to more people. That is the opposite of what Peter says to do. He says, live a godly life. Live a righteous life for the world around you. People are going to be drawn to the truth of the Word of God in your life and how you are living it. That's what he says is going to happen. It's like it's the opposite of what you think. Maybe I should talk like that unbelievable. Maybe I should partake in some of the things they're doing so that they'll see that I'm just like them. Maybe I should compromise a little bit here or a little bit there. Peter says, don't do it. Even when you're misunderstood, don't do it. I conclude with an illustration. <clears throat> I hope this illustration doesn't like blow your mind. Maybe it will. A couple of weeks ago, a, a mega church pastor committed suicide. His name was Jared Wilson. And it was actually on major headline news. I don't know if you saw it or not. And it was on the major headline news because in my mind I can just I could just already imagine what the world was saying. He's not just a pastor of a, of a large church, but he had struggled with suicide his whole life. He had a whole ministry of suicide. People that had that tendency, depression and suicide. He had written books on how as a Christian to deal with this issue in life. He had had Seminars. He had articles published in major news networks. And this was a tragic outcome of his life. The world will look at that and say, yeah, that Christian stuff, it doesn't work. Sometimes even us as Christians will say, Ah, he just didn't. He didn't listen to his own sermons. I say something like that. Misunderstand the truth about sin. That we are all sinners. We struggle with sin in our life, even though our soul is redeemed. To me, the good news is his soul was redeemed. It's a sin to kill yourself. It is a sin. But God, when he redeems us, he saves us from past, present, and future sin. His soul is redeemed. As far as I'm concerned, 
I'm making a judgment call. You might not agree with me. I'm making a judgment call, but I believe that man is in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ because his soul is redeemed. I'm not making an excuse for sin. Sin is sin. As Christians, the Bible says we are to hate sin. We are to despise it. I mean, that man preached against it specifically. Helped thousands of people. And his ministry will continue to help thousands of people because of the power of the gospel to save a lost person and to give them the hope that there's life beyond this world that we will one day be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and we will finally be home. But the world will misunderstand you. And we will misunderstand you. So what do we do? We keep on proclaiming the truth. We keep on in the war abstaining from the fleshly stuff of the world, the fleshly outward stuff that happens in our life. And then we keep on with your righteous life that you're striving to live because you know that's how people are going to notice the truth of who God is. And we will be able to win, to influence and win them for Christ. We're not going to win everybody with your godly life. But you will win some. The God says. Let's pray. My Lord, just thank you for the word and for the truth and what Peter writes today to us about how we handle the misunderstandings of life. And they come to us in, in many different ways. I pray this morning that the truth that Peter gives us through your divine inspiration might help us, Lord, as we face the stuff of this world. May we be faithful, Lord, to proclaim. Do the opposite of what we naturally would do. Do the opposite. Abstain from the fleshly stuff of this world. Do the opposite. Keeping our behavior pure and chaste in this world of darkness. Continuing to live. Realizing we're not perfect. But we're living for you. And our goal is to be a bright light to a world of darkness. May we live that kind of life. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today who has not genuinely and honestly accepted your offer of grace and been born again, realize that they're a sinner, they're hopelessly lost without you, and they're willing to turn from their sin and trust in you alone for salvation. Lord, may they do that even today, right now, in your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me as we sing a, a decision song? If you want to make a decision for Christ, I encourage you to do that today. Oh, my soul.